This is um, lecture number seven, and this is the beginning of chapter three. We're just going to look at the type of political systems that exist worldwide and look at some of the powers that uh, the Constitution shares with the federal government and the states. Now, federalism is a central feature of the American political system. It's the division and sharing of power between the national government and the states. The balance of power between the two levels of government has spawned some of the most intense controversies in American history. So historically, national interests have clashed with states' rights, and even today when most Americans think of the government in Washington as vastly more powerful than the state governments, federalism is still one of the most important founding principles of the United States. Now, all political systems, like ours, rely on two things <coughs> to, um, to signify that they're representative governments. They rely on elections, and they rely on the notion of consent of the governed, that the, gov the government is not legitimate unless we have given as a voting population, we have given our consent to their rule. So in the United States, Britain, France, Germany, uh, and even Russia, the consent of the governed has been granted. But in places like Zimbabwe, uh, China, uh, North Korea, certainly uh, there's the facsimile of the consent of the government, government but it's not real. So, you, what you need to understand is that federalism and separation of powers are two different things. Separation of powers are the unique powers given to each of the political institutions. Federalism is the relationship between the national government, the state governments, and the local governments. There's a difference, so don't confuse the two see it done all the time. Federalism is a political system uh, in comparison to the others which are unitary and um, uh, confederate. It is, uh, it's, it's a unique system, but it's different from separation of powers and checks and balances. <coughs> so don't make the same mistake a lot of kids do. Now you'll notice that there are three different systems. A what we can say is that all political systems may be evaluated according to their geographic distribution of power. Um, a unitary system is one that concentrates all policy making powers in one central geographic place. And that would a good example of that would be Great Britain, where at least until recently most decisions were made in London, even even for decisions that could have been decided at the local level, it was instead divided or decided by the ministries in London. A confederal or confederate confederation spreads the power among many subunits, such as states, and has a weak central government. The Confederate States of America had a weak central government. The Russian Confederation after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991 had a weak central government. And a federal system, of course, divides the power between the central government and the subunits, or the states and then the local governments. All political sy systems fall on a continuum from the most concentrated amount of power to the least. Now, unitary systems, or unitary governments, may be placed on the left side of the political spectrum, according to the degree of concentration. Confederal uh, governments are placed to the right, and federal governments fall in between. So a unitary system would be represented by China, Britain, and France. A federal system would be U.S. and Canada. Remember, Canada's states, in essence, are provinces. And then a confederal system would be the U.S. under, under the Articles of Confederation <clears throat> and the Confederate States of America during the Civil War. Now, one of the uh, things that we do recognize with federalism is that it just 
the distribution of powers between central government uh, to which citizens can turn for policy goals and regional government fits the United States because we are we're such a large, large country. It's not that large companies can't be unitary. China is a very large com country and it, it is also unitary. But Canada and the U.S. have felt that a federal system is um, is, is better at governing a very, very large geographically sized uh, country like both of them are. Now federalism was also carefully defined in the Constitution as a founding principle of the U.S. political system. But even so, the nature of federalism is dynamic and it has been shaped through the years by laws, by the Supreme Court, and by debates among prominent, prominent elected officials and statesmen. So how does, or how is federalism provided for in the Constitution? This is another look at the systems um, divided between the unitary system, the federal system, and the confederate system. Okay. When the colonies declared their independence from Britain in 1776, they reacted against the British unitary system in which all of the political and economic power was, con was concentrated in London. Although the British did not impose this power consistently until after the French and Indian War in 1763, new controls on the colonial government in the late 1760s and in the uh, early 1770s before the Revolutionary War became a major source of friction that led to that war. The uh, American Revolution, or during the American Revolution, the states reacted to Britain's unitary system by creating the Articles of Confederation. They knew what they didn't want. They didn't want Britain's system. So they, so they came up with something new, and this being the Articles, and this being a Confederate system. And this Confederate system gave all powers to the states. The framers at the Constitutional Convention tried to balance the perceived tyranny of the unitary system with the chaos created by the Confederate system. And by outlining a what we call a hybrid, the <clears throat> federal system that is designed and implemented by the Constitution. Now, federalism then became a major building block for preserving freedoms while still maintaining order in the new nation. So let's look at the kind of powers that exist. The first type of powers are, are what we call delegated powers. <clears throat> or what is known as expressed powers because they are delegated to the federal government. And the Constitution grants the national government certain powers such as these. And these powers would be represented by the war powers, uh, the power to regulate interstate and foreign commerce. Remember we talked about the problems in the class about the the 13 different foreign policies and the fact that that weakness could be exploited by nations that were more powerful than the United States at that time. And we also gave the federal government, but also the state governments and the local governments, the power to tax and spend. So delegated powers, which remember are also called expressed or enumerated powers, are those that are specifically granted to the federal government by the Constitution. So let's look at <clears throat> the war powers. So let's look at uh, deeper into um, enumerated powers. These come about in Section one, Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. And the four of the big powers are the war power, because we know that the national government is responsible for protecting the nation from external attacks and for declaring war when necessary. Today, defense includes not only maintaining a standing army, Navy and Air Force, but also the ability to mobilize industry and scientific knowledge to back the efforts of the military. So a, a uh, entity like DARPA uh, would be a representative of that. Then there's the power to regulate interstate and foreign commerce. 
the national government has the responsibility to regulate commerce between the U.S. and foreign nations. There's no one else that should be doing this. Otherwise, you get chaos. So Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 gives the United States government not only the ability to uh, regulate foreign trade, but also to, re to uh, regulate interstate commerce, which is the trade between states. So the Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. The government regulates a wide range of human activity, including agriculture, transportation, finance, product safety, uh, labor relations, and the workplace. Few aspects of today's economy affect commerce in only one state, so most activities are subject to the national government's constitutional authority. The power to tax and spend would be the third power that we need to talk about. So even when Congress lacks the constitutional power to legislate, for example, education and agriculture are in the province of the states, its power to appropriate money <clears throat> provides Congress with a great deal of control can't do things without money, without green, and states have to, in many cases, rely on the federal government to provide that largesse. Um, Congress may with when Congress finances an undertaking, it determines how the money will be spent. Uh, it could be through mandates, as we'll see in this chapter. It could be through uh, laws, through court decisions. The um, The uh, Congress may threaten to withhold funds if a project does not meet federal guidelines. In recent years, Congress has refused to finance any program <coughs> in which benefits are denied because of race, color, national origin, and more recently, gender and physical handicaps. Now, other powers are specifically delegated to the national government uh, including coining money, which was a very big problem during the, uh, during the use of the Articles of Confederation, uh, establishing a postal system, and the right of the government to borrow against credit. All those are important powers. Now, <clears throat> inherent powers are a little bit different. Inherent powers are those not specifically stated in the Constitution, but are considered necessary for any government to carry out its functions. So for instance, um, the government is, the national government is the only one that, that is really allowed to recognize governments abroad. Let's say a, there's a coup d'etat in a small country and the United States recognizes the new government. The national government is the only one that can send or has trade policies to that, that deal with other countries. It has to be on a country by country level. And the national government is the only one uh, that is empowered to do that. But there isn't a stated power to do that. It's just inherent that because of what the federal government is the national government is, it is the only one that can do that. The states cannot, though they have a national guard, it's different, but the states cannot have their own navy, their own air force, their own, uh, their own army. All those are in the province of the federal government. Now these were derived by the, uh, by the royal prerogative powers, which basically said that, um, that some laws, uh, belong to the crown and the monarchy. Now, so what do we have that, that uh, would be representatives of inherent power? Well, you've got the ability to wage war. You have the ability to conduct foreign affairs. Like I said, the recognition of the country, sending ambassadors, things like that. And the right to, to exist as a nation state. Those are inherent. Now, implied powers are derived from enumerated power and what we call the necessary and proper clause. 
or what's known as the elastic clause. Now, these powers are not stated specifically, but are considered to be reasonably implied through the exercise of delegated powers. So from the beginning, the meaning of federalism has been open to debate. In the late 18th century, Alexander Hamilton, the first secretary of the treasury, championed loose construction, or what's known as the view that the Constitution should be broadly interpreted. The national government created by the government, the national government created by the government represented the supreme law of the land, and that's, uh, that's written in Article 6, and its powers should be broadly defined and liberally construed. And if we were looking at how things are divided up politically in today's uh, environment, Democrats would be very much in favor of loose construction. GOP, on the other hand, would be in favor of its counterpart, what we call strict construction. Now, strict construction was articulated by Thomas Jefferson. And his view was that the federal government was the product of an agreement among the states, and that the main threat to personal liberty was likely to come from the national government. So Jefferson's strict constructionist or strict construction required uh, that the powers of the national government should be narrowly construed and sharply limited. The famous clash, or this famous clash in interpretations of the Constitution, shaped the political culture of the United States for many, for many years, well into the 1950s. Since then, we probably, until the 90s, we probably have leaned more toward loose constructionism. Now, Washington decide, uh, decided with Hamilton on this, and, and there is nothing in the Constitution which says that the federal government can establish a bank, and this bank would have been in competition with private concerns. But at the same time, it doesn't say the United States government can't do that. So the Federalist position regarding implied powers became part of the national fabric, largely through the first great Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall. So other examples of implied powers would be the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is now a federal department. The fact that the federal government in the 1950s built the interstate highway system. NASA is also an example of an implied powers. Now there's a couple other powers I want to talk about before we uh, we sign off. We're going to start with this uh, this slide uh, in our uh, lecture eight, but there's two types of powers I do want to talk about, and then when we start uh, eight, we are going to talk about um, the necessary and proper debate again, the call of the Maryland, the, the nullification controversy. But there's something called concurrent powers, and concurrent powers uh, are powers that are granted not to the national government but uh, also, but are reserved for the states, excuse me. States, however, may hold some of the same powers that the national government has, unless they have been given exclusively to the national government, either by provision of the Constitution, which means that it's written uh, somewhere in there, or by judicial interpretation, which means that a court case has, or a court decision has given the government um, hegemony over a new field law. Now concurrent powers are those that are held by both the national government and the state governments, and in fact some of these are even held by the local governments. So an example of a concurrent power would be the fact that the federal government, the state governments, and local governments can all levy taxes. So the federal government has income tax, the state governments have income tax, local governments have property tax. That's an example of three different types of taxes that come under the same umbrella. And each of the um, levels of government, national, state, and local, all have the ability to maintain separate court systems. So you know that the courthouse on Avenue M is Superior Court. That's local. But downtown is a branch of the State Supreme Court. And there's also 
the federal court downtown, the federal district court, all three levels um, within proximity of each other. Now, even though this exists, federal, federalism limits state powers in that states cannot unduly burden citizens with taxes. I wish they took that seriously nowadays. Neither can they interfere with a function of the national government, nor can they abridge the terms of a treaty of the United States government, and states generally don't attempt to do that. Now the other type, and the last thing we'll look at in this lecture, is reserved powers. And reserved powers are those held by the states alone. They are not listed as delegated powers are, but they are guaranteed by the Tenth Amendment as reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Perhaps the problem is it doesn't name any of them. So reserved powers include establishing local governments and regulating trade within the states. We call that intrastate commerce, I-N-T-R-A instead of I-N-T-E-R, which is trade between states. The states also have the ability to police their, loca their, their, their locales. So we have uh, cities have police departments, counties have sheriff's departments. And not only is it do the police or do these powers exist to uh, enhance safety, um, but they also are there to enhance the health, the morals, and the welfare of the people. However, like I said, these uh, powers are not listed in the Constitution. And so there's sometimes a question about whether certain powers are delegated to the national government or reserved for the states. Hence, the gay marriage problem. Because remember, marriage is in the province of the states. Uh, but can a national government, um, in essence, legislate or the courts dictate that states change their laws on constitutional grounds? I forgot one here. Prohibited powers. Their prohibited, prohibited powers are denied to either the national government, uh, the state governments, or both. So for example, the federal government can't tax exports because exports come from many, many states. But state governments cannot tax either imports or exports. The federal government can tax imports through tariffs. States can't make treaties with, states can't make treaties um, or, and, and, and they can't also declare war. You might be very upset with a nation next door but you have to convince the federal government to go to war. The state of California can't. So this ends lecture seven. I will, I will change lecture seven. This is already there into lecture six. This is lecture seven. And the, pers the first part of chapter three. And sorry, this went 23 minutes, but there's a lot to get in.